ecosystem. We're in the startup ecosystem. We're uh, at incubators or in MBA programs or we're at multinationals, you know, and we always really take for granted with entrepreneurship that we need to grow. <laughs> if you're a founder and you go to a incubator, one of the very first things that you are going to see is a PowerPoint slide with the hockey stick, <laughs> right? I mean, just, uh, you know, exponential growth. Uh, this is what we need to do. And we also learn that our definition of success is the exit. In other words, uh, either getting our company acquired uh, or otherwise having a uh, initial public offering, an IPO or going public on the stock market. But the long and the short is, you know, you are expected to grow basically for roughly three to five years uh, and then sell the company. If you do this multiple times, then you're a serial entrepreneur and then you're even more successful. <laughs> yeah, this is what you get from the incubators, but it doesn't deviate that much also in business school. So if you look in typical uh, MBA programs, another thing also is you are pushed as quickly as possible towards investors. You know, and there is really a, um, you know, so-called common sense that tells us that we are not able to start startups without venture capital <laughs> or angels or some, you know, or some other form of, uh, of funding. Now, you know, Silicon Valley and the whole surrounding VC ecosystem as such is what, like 40 years old? <laughs> you know, and, and if we stop and think about it, somehow we managed to start companies before the VCs were around. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> um, you know, the problem really is that uh, if you look at incubators uh, and you actually look at the history of incubators, it's actually really quite interesting. Incubators as such, so the very first incubator that ever existed was called the Batavia Industrial Center, and it was located in Batavia, New York. Now, this was a town that had some industry. Uh, the corporation at a certain point moved out of town, and suddenly all of the people living there found themselves without jobs. Now, one of the local rich families, of course, you know, they own restaurants and movie theaters. And well, you know, they didn't like <laughs> the local people being unemployed because nobody would then patronize their establishments. So what they did is they basically bought up a really large empty building and then said, well, we're going to help to stimulate uh, the local economy <laughs> by helping potential entrepreneurs start local SMEs that can help to revitalize the local economy. <laughs> so, you know, they provided uh, shared facilities and desks and administrative services and secretaries and, you know, staplers and whatever, <laughs> I mean, you know, for, for, for everybody. And uh, essentially the definition of success from the Batavia Industrial Center was allowing a company to become so successful that they could then move out of the the BSC, the Batavia Industrial Center, and then graduate into a, basically an office on Main Street. <laughs> that was the definition of success. It had nothing to do with unicorns. <laughs> so um, basically, the funny part about this is at one point, uh, there was a, uh, some basically a chicken coop <laughs> that had moved into the building, and they were breeding these little baby chickens. And that was sort of when uh, Joe Manusco, the guy who had started it, had his aha moment, and he said, oh, they're incubating chickens. But wait a minute, I'm incubating startups. <laughs> And that's actually where the term incubator actually got its, uh, got its name from. So, uh, you know, fast forward and we start, uh, you know, having other kinds of incubators uh, and basically uh, what we would now call high tech incubators. This also uh, started, and again, looking sort of at, uh, at history, um, there was also basically a guy uh, named Bushnell uh, who actually had started uh, Atari <laughs> and also the Chuck E. Cheese uh, pizza restaurants. <laughs> and he'd made uh, quite a uh, fortune from this. And he was basically trying to figure out ways to get return on his capital. So what he did is he started a similar incubator, but then he basically funded all of these startups to implement his various business ideas. And for him, really, the idea was creating a return on an investment. So what happened was the definition of success in this particular case 
was trying to get the company to the point that he could sell it. <laughs> And, and it turned out actually that uh, Nolan Bushnell, that he, he did actually quite well <laughs> with the BIC. I think uh, he'd started roughly, I think, a dozen, uh, dozen companies. I think half of them uh, sold. <laughs> uh, you know, the other uh, half, I think, uh, didn't succeed. But of course, you know, it wasn't a bad percentage, and he wound up wake, making a whole lot of money <laughs> off of doing this. And this was sort of one of the first examples of a more high-tech incubator. If you then you know, extrapolate that a bit further, you start getting more modern high-tech incubators like uh, Y Combinator. <laughs> and I'm sure most of you have probably heard of Paul Graham, uh, who was uh, one of the founders uh, of Y Combinator. What's kind of interesting is that Paul Graham wrote a blog. <laughs> he has a blog. And he wrote this one blog post that essentially says, you know, and I'm quoting this, I am a manufacturer of economic inequality. So, you know, he understands full well, really, how this is working. But uh, the idea is, you know, this, the whole Y Combinator model of essentially pumping funding into startups, growing exponentially and exiting, this made so much money for the folks over at Y Combinator that other incubators then really started copying the model. And that's how we got, you know, tech stars and, uh, you know, 500 startups and all kinds of other uh, incubators. And eventually this whole Y Combi Combinator formula went around the world, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, we've got it here in the, in the Netherlands and Amsterdam where I live, I'm sure you have it the, in the UK and, and in Manchester probably, and, and nobody really questions it. <laughs> but the problem is that uh, we need to ask ourselves the question, first of all, do we really need funding to create startups? Yeah. And second of all, uh, you know, is, do, I mean, is exiting even helpful? Is this getting us where we need to go? You know, and is growth good? Now, there's another really great uh, British economist <laughs> whose name is Kate Rayworth. <laughs> and uh, she wrote this really brilliant book called Donut Economics. And she also gave a really great TED talk. Now, she has a beautiful analogy about nature. And she talks about trees. <laughs> now, she says that, now imagine that you've got a tree. Now, at the very beginning of the tree's life, it grows really fast, like almost exponentially. But then at a certain point, that tree starts to reach its maximum size and that growth starts to taper off. And at a cer certain point, that tree, it stops growing and it starts thriving. Now, if that tree wants to grow further, it can't. <laughs> it's reached its maximum size. But what the tree does is it drops seeds. And those seeds form new trees, <laughs> etc. Now, it turns out that this principle is a lot older. There's a principle that's called subsidiary, sub subsidiarity, and it actually comes from the Catholic Church. <laughs> and that is actually a principle of not growing any larger than something actually needs to be to optimally perform its function. Now, there's a really great book that's called uh, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus by Douglas Rushkoff. <laughs> and he uh, makes a really nice example in that, like, let's say that I wanted to start a, a pizza place, right? <laughs> so you basically start this pizza place. It's really successful. You know, the next thing that I can do is, you know, either I can try and turn it into a national chain, <laughs> maybe even an international chain, or instead I can help other people to start their own pizza places. <laughs> You know, and if you really stop and think about it, it's probably good enough for each of us to sort of have our own, uh, you know, pizza parlor. <laughs> and also the end result of what we're going to wind up getting, it's going to be much richer, much more diverse <laughs> and probably much better quality when, you know, different people are sort of implementing their own things that they can put their own personal stamp on. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, what I like to, to say to people, you know, and this is also especially relevant now with what's going on with, with COVID-19, what are we trying to achieve with economic recovery? <laughs> you know, since March 2020, when the stock market crashed, and of course, uh, since then, with the meteoric rise, you know, back to all time highs that we have now, it has never been as evident that Wall Street is completely disconnected from Main Street. 
So what we need to be asking is why are we, and also why is our government not facilitating ecosystems for rebuilding local economies as opposed to creating an ecosystem that is friendly for foreign investors? <laughs> you, you, you've asked us to come in every now and again, and I'm just was just wondering on that. Um, that question is a great question. I love it. But should should we actually be creating companies for investors? Should we still be running towards that and growth, or should we actually be creating um, companies for the good of society as such here as well? You know, is investors still the ultimate game in your mind? Um, I, I think if we look at the incentive structure, I think that uh, the incentives that investors have is not the same as the incentives that the founders have uh, or the investors that the rest of society has, you know, including the customers and also including the employees uh, of that particular company. Again, remembering that the startup ecosystem was created by those with capital looking to, you know, looking to get more, we need to ask ourselves the question, why is it that nine out of every 10 startups fail? Is entrepreneurship really that hard? Or is, you know, or, or has this uh, system been hijacked to become a casino for investors? You know, and that's the thing, you know, the, we know that, you know, this 90% failure rate of startups, th this is well known. But the idea is that investors essentially place a series of small bets across startups. So if you know that only one of them is going to succeed, that means the other nine are going to fail. So that means that that one that succeeds, it needs to be such a knock out of the park, you know, it needs to be so successful that it more than compensates for those nine failures. And that's the reason why with, with investors, it's not okay to just start a nice lifestyle business <laughs> or, or to, to, to create a business that's just moderately successful. That doesn't work for the investors. <laughs> you know, that's why they're looking for the, for the 10X returns, you know, 18X returns, you know, all, all of these crazy numbers. And truth be told, they haven't delivered. <laughs> If you look historically at the performance of venture capital over the last 25 years, uh, over 80% uh, of the VC funds have failed to keep up with the stock market. And 90% of the so-called unicorns have never been cash flow positive. Okay, so <laughs> I, I I do totally get that. And I, I think I do understand that um, to a certain extent. I'm hoping everyone else is listening has understands this as well. Um, so the, the, the problem with always looking at the stock market is it's based on profits and they get taxed by the government. And sometimes it's that taxation that's actually pulling them away from that profit and away from being an, a good opportunity for an investor as well. So there's other things at play rather than than just the entrepreneur in, in this makeup, isn't there? There's, there's all these other external factors that make or break these companies. So it's not just the investors, it's other things. So how does that all kind of interlink with your concept of growth here? Right. So uh, you're bringing up a number of things, including taxation. Of course, you know, ta taxation uh, of uh, capital gains is as much less than the kind of taxation that one would have on, say, our salary, <laughs> you know, and it's also well known that uh, many of the rich uh, find all kinds of different uh, loopholes <laughs> uh, to avoid uh, paying taxes. I mean, Warren Buffett talks about this uh, quite frequently, and I think Politico also recently put out a great article talking about exactly how much uh, Jeff Bezos uh, pays in taxes and, uh, and these kinds of things. But what we need to understand here is that uh, these companies that receive this investment, investor money, they become really good at one thing. And what they become good at is spending investor money. <laughs> because the thing is, personnel is expensive. You know, and if you're starting a business and you actually need to bootstrap that business, which basically means uh, starting the business based upon your own 
savings, <laughs> you know, and having to organically grow the business based off of customer revenue, the first thing you're not, you're not going to do is hire a whole bunch of people because <laughs> that is the quickest way uh, to be able to put yourself out of business because people are expensive. So um, what basically winds up happening is it, you can think of startups as a little bit like a battery chicken. <laughs> You know, so you, Back to you know, incubator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what you're doing is you are force feeding these uh, startups with investment capital so they can artificially plump themselves up. So they get really juicy and attractive looking, <laughs> you know, and once they've reached this certain size, then they are liquidated. <laughs> and that's really the moment when all of the value is pulled out of the companies. <laughs> now, what happens is when you grow that quickly, you are going to be very heavily revenue losing. <laughs> that's the reason why, why 90% of the unicorns are revenue losing, because they, they quite simply, they can't keep up with their rate of hiring. <laughs> they can't keep up uh, with the extent to which they're bleeding money. And of course, one of the most famous examples of this was WeWork, <laughs> uh, you know, which was basically spend, losing money five times faster than it was actually getting it uh, from customer revenue. Now, the whole purpose for this exercise is that uh, basically they are trying to you know, basically build this kind of hype machine so they can pull a pump and dump scheme on the public markets. So they basically pump up these revenue losing companies, make them look really exciting, <laughs> and then uh, hope that people, you know, are, are going to basically buy <laughs> these, uh, these companies uh, during the IPO. But of course, what happens after you've bought the stock during the IPO? Well, guess what? The company is still revenue losing <laughs> because the fundamentals of these companies were never sound in the first place. So either the economy keeps growing, you know, and these imaginary valuations continue to grow <laughs> or at a certain point uh you know you happen to get a recession kind of like what we also had in uh, in march 2020 um and you know at that moment of course that is when uh the last investor is left holding the bag <laughs> and that last investor is retail investors like us it is our investment funds and it is our pension funds the other because they, they buy these stocks. The reason why pension funds are getting into riskier investments, by the way, like this, is because the interest rates are so low at the moment <laughs> that uh, they, they simply can't get enough money to be able to pay for people's retirements using safer benefits and, you know, safer investments. And that's sort of why they're starting to invest in, in these kinds of uh, stocks and, uh, you know, also in VC funds. Actually, 60% of the capital in VC funds in the United States is also from pension funds. So you need to also ask the question, when these companies like WeWork are bleeding money, whose money are they losing? <laughs> you know, if, 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 if that's coming from, it's actually coming from our pension funds. And this also, I think, should, should stop and give us pause. So, so let's stop and evaluate this. You've got uh, companies that are basically losing money. <laughs> uh, those who buy the stock eventually, you know, are are, are put in a in a you know in in a tough position. Those who are, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, you need to start asking the question: Who actually is this ask, is this working for? <laughs> and the truth is, who is you know, especially considering that eighty percent of the VC funds didn't keep pace with the stock market. The answer of who this is working for is it is working for the fund managers <laughs> because they their compensation basically is typically what they call two percent asset under management fees and a 20% carry. So basically what that means is that the total amount of cash that's in this VC fund, they get 2% of this as a management fee every year. The 20% carry, this is a performance incentive. So basically if the company grows and they can have a successful exit, they get 20% of that. So let's stop and think about this. This 20% carry, you know, this embeds the growth imperative. <laughs> you know yes. yeah this this definitely needs a really good bit of explanation but basically the middleman always wins is basically is what we're, we're going down here aren't we great yes. so it, it, explain this concept of uh that you've just you've just said so 
Yeah. So, so basically, you know, so this, this growth imperative, this, uh, you know, the, the, the hockey stick, you know, and, and, and the exits, I mean, this is really all just really built into the, uh, into the incentive structure. And if you think about it, it's not necessarily any different for uh, incubators either, because the majority of incubators take equity in their startups, which makes them investors. <laughs> so you also need to consider that there's a direct conflict of interest between the financial health of these incubators and what they're teaching us. Nobody talks about this conflict of interest, but it's really important we address it. There's a similar conflict of interest in our business schools, especially the big ones. Um, if you think about your typical Harvard, Stanford, uh, you know, these kinds of schools, um, they have endowments. <laughs> and, you know, to be quite frank, those who are giving the endowments don't necessarily want the status quo to change. <laughs> so they're also in a similar position where they have a financial conflict of interest between the welfare of their organization and what they're teaching. You have this less with smaller, smaller universities and smaller business schools, because quite frankly, they have fewer endowments. And instead, they get most of their money either from the government uh, through subsidies or, or tuition. <laughs> and actually, the smaller universities, for precisely this reason, are far more interested in new business models and social business models, <laughs> um, precisely because it's good research and they can potentially even get some subsidy for it. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it kind of works both ways. And in all of these cases, it's sort of follow the money. <laughs> but, you know, the, the point I think here is, is that um, we should think about, first of all, how can we make bootstrapping sexy again? <laughs> you know, there's some really great movements that are out there that have questioned uh, venture capital. Uh, Zebras Unite is, is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with them, but they, they say, you know, we don't want to be uh, unicorns. We would far, far rather be zebras, <laughs> you know, and, and sort of list all the reasons why, uh, why zebras are, are more down to earth. And, you know, there's really an increasing, uh, yeah, I would, I would just say, sea of, of voices that are sort of questioning the status quo. Like if you look at, for example, the book Rework by Jason Fried from, uh, from Buffer, <laughs> it's a, sort of another really good uh, book that is questioning, you know, why we would need uh, funding and exponential growth among other, among other things and sort of how we can build um, better businesses and more independent businesses. Because ultimately, you know, we need to consider business as a form of activism. <laughs> business is one of the most effective forms of activism. Just think about, for example, uh, all the vegetarian meat, you know, social enterprises that are out there. You know, I mean, the, you know, NGOs like People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals have been out there protesting forever. <laughs> but at the end of the day, what is really helping is companies like Beyond Meat and, uh, you know, Impossible Burger and Garden Gourmet and Corn and all of these, you know, great, com great companies that are making these meat substitutes that are causing the majority of, of meat eaters to become some degree of flexitarian. <laughs> Just because why on earth would you want to harm animals if you can have almost the same thing, <laughs> you know, with, with, with almost no loss of quality, <laughs> you know, systemic problems require systemic solutions. You know, and, and too much responsibility has been put by lobbies, mostly from large industry on individual consumers. You know, I can make the choice to go live in the forest off the grid and, you know, just eat my own vegetables that I grew, grow. But first of all, I'm no longer participating in society if I do that. And second of all, the majority of people quite simply are not willing to do this. <laughs> so individual choice is great. But if you can, if you think about something like fair trade, you know, if you can make, make it as easy as just making one purchasing decision, over another purchasing decision. <laughs> you know, that is the power of social enterprise. <laughs> you know, and there's all kinds of really great companies like, uh, you know, in, in Amsterdam, we've got Tony Chocolonely, which makes uh, really good chocolate, you know, but they're trying to do it with slave free, <laughs> child slave labor free 
they haven't succeeded yet. It's a tough issue, but uh, but they're working towards that, and they've put a whole lot of uh, awareness towards the issue. Also, another really great uh, Amsterdam-based company called Fairphone <laughs> uh, that also uh, makes essentially um, you know there's uh, these conflict uh, met, you know sort of metals and minerals you know from from Africa, and uh, they're also they brought a whole lot of awareness to this issue. Also, trying to produce fairer cell phones. <laughs> you know what you can do with a company is enormous. And what's even better is that you can put pressure on the rest of the industry <laughs> because the incumbents at that point have to compete with you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and this is brilliant because I, I, I can really see a massive takeoff of social businesses and social enterprise businesses like this. The question is though, are they still following the model of grow it, get an investor in, sell it? Are they still following those models though? Yes, they are. And, and this is one of the things, the questions we need to ask about social enterprise. So social enterprise very obviously is a step towards the solution, but somewhere in our gut, we are understanding it's not getting us far enough. There's too much greenwashing. I just read, read an article the other day that actually said that, that over 50% of investments now are what they call ESG investments, you know, environment, uh, social and, and governance. <laughs> But how much of this is real and how much of this is marketing? Now, I think, again, we need to start asking questions about the business models. <laughs> now, if you think about impact investors, the problem is they can have really good intentions. Some of them do, but they're embedded. You know, you've got good people in a broken system. It's the same thing also with the social entrepreneurs themselves. Hearts of gold, great intentions, but, but trying to maneuver themselves in a broken system. Now, social enterprise has really taken over a whole lot of things from the standard Silicon Valley business model. You've got impact investors <laughs> uh, and you've also got impact exits, you know, the typical, you know, selling your uh, B corporation to Unilever, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. Now, if you look again at the incentive structures of social enterprise, go to the impact investors. The majority of them, once again, have this same fee structure. 2% asset under management, 20% uh, carry. <laughs> so truthfully speaking, they say that their intentions are different, but because of the embedded incentive structure, they are, are incentivized to do the same things. <laughs> now it can be done differently. There's a very interesting example, also British, by the way, you all uh, produce a number of very great examples, uh, that is called uh, Snowball Impact Management. Now, Snowball uh, is uh, basically an ESG fund. So they are, you know, are basically social investors, but there's one really important difference. They have what is basically called a cost of service fee structure. What this means is essentially they are running like a not-for-profit. Stop and think about this. A not-for-profit impact investor. Cool. <laughs> so in other words, uh, what they're doing is they have, um, you know, basically they, they are, their asset under management, basically that fee is the cost of running their business. <laughs> Assuming middle-class salaries with a middle-class pension. Now that sounds reasonable enough, you know, and, and Carrie, eh, you know, let's, let's forget about the carry, <laughs> which basically eliminates that, um, you know, that, that growth imperative. Brilliant. Now let's ask the question, why is every impact investor not doing this? <laughs> well, I think at some point everyone starts getting a bit greedy and wants a bit more money, don't they? Is that, is that the reason why it's kind of like not quite working or is it that this model is becoming more prevalent? Um, well, you're right. I mean, it's greed at the end of the day. But the, the problem is this is in conflict with impact. You can't have it both ways. <laughs> you know, there is no reason why anybody needs to extract more money out of the system than a middle class salary with a middle class pension. And I don't care if they're an investor, a founder, uh, just or just an employee, because let's face it, the majority of employees are not getting anything more than that. And you can basically say that, oh, yeah, but entrepreneurial risk. 
but truthfully, you know, especially for the ones that are venture funded, they're getting pay paid from day day one anyway. <laughs> so tell me again about the amount of risk that they're taking, you know, plus with the most uh, commercial entity structures of companies, you're also shielded uh, from, you know, legal liability uh, to a certain extent as well, as long as you're not doing anything that's outright fraudulent. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, th this whole entrepreneurial risk thing doesn't entirely check out. But look, let me tell you a bit about my experience. <laughs> so uh, I myself am an entrepreneur. I'm a social entrepreneur. <laughs> and I started a radically open security, which is basically the world's first not for profit computer security consultancy company. Not for profit. <laughs> What that means is we give away all of our profits to charity. Yes, I said all of our profits. The way that it works is we're using an archaic business structure from the Dutch church. <laughs> so uh, sometimes a church wants to do a commercial spinoff. And then, uh, you know, they'll do some kind of commercial activity. And that money goes back to the church with a tax benefit. So we basically decided, okay, we're going to make our commercial spinoff a security company, and we're going to make our church <laughs> the NLNet Foundation. And NLNet, NLNet is a foundation, a charitable foundation that has been around for over 25 years that supports open source, digital rights, and anything for a better open and transparent internet. Those of you who are in tech will recognize the names of some of the people funded by NLNet. They have funded GNU, Tor, EFF, Jitsi, WireGuard, DNSSEC, <laughs> you know, basically a lot of really well-known uh, projects <laughs> that quite simply just make the internet better. <laughs> so um, yeah, so basically the idea is 90% uh, of our profits are every year by law, you know, go to charity. You know, if, if I were to not pay this, I would have the tax authorities knocking on my door saying, hey, you know, about this uh, donation that you made, <laughs> it's time. Uh, the last 10% is my cash flow buffer. <laughs> you know, and I need a cash flow buffer in order to be able to run a successful business. Now, remember that when I say donated profit, profit is what we have after my customers have paid me. After I have paid my staff members and, and we do pay market conform wages <laughs> and also our customers pay market conform fees uh, for our services. And also after I've made necessary reinvestments into the business. <laughs> In other words, like, you know, last year I had to probably spend about 30, 40,000 euros on, uh, for example, uh, migrating to a new data center and, uh, you know, buying a whole huge amounts of hardware, you know, and servers and, and all kinds of things uh, to basically be able to, to create our new setup. That is all necessary investment, you know, for what's now a seven-year-old business. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but that also comes out of the profit. So that means that we need to donate less. And it's also, you know, I can even create, if I want to, um, reserves uh, for the year after, if I know there's a big expenditure uh, that's coming up. So it's kind of like a ballet with money because <laughs> you sort of know that this big, uh, big hit is coming at the end of the year, but you kind of have to juggle it, you know, cash flow, cash flow wise to make sure that it works, but it does. You know, I can basically give, I can want a company that can donate all of its, you know, pr profits to charity and still survive. You know, so when social enterprises are saying, you know, we're donating 5%, 10%, even 50%, you know, I'm raising the ante. <laughs> you know, can we build more not-for-profit businesses? You know, it's, not, it's actually not rocket science and, and anybody can do this. And it's not that it's only, this only works for security companies. <laughs> I don't believe that we're, we're special and magical that this formula only works for us. But I think that the concept of a not-for-profit business uh, would also work in many other application domains, whether it's education, healthcare, <laughs> uh, agriculture. <laughs> you know, I think there's uh, many other areas in which we can do this. So after, you know, and also it's worth saying in the, in the first six years of my company, my company's existence, we gave over a half a million euros to NLNet. <laughs> you know, so it's like the opposite of philanthropy where you get rich first and then you give it away. <laughs> it's actually, you know, building that, you know, 
those donations into the actual core of your business. And it's like running sort of like a front end, you know, commercial business for a back end charitable, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, donation system. So it's really great. And, and anyone can do this. So after we've also won a whole bunch of awards, uh, CIO magazine called me the most innovative IT leader of the Netherlands. Um, also, I was a finalist for the uh, EU Women's Innovation Prize. Uh, so, you know, and uh, yeah, we, there were only nine of us basically uh, that were finalists that year. So, uh, you know, this is getting recognized as being, uh, as being successful. So what I did is three years ago, I started a uh, incubator called Nonprofit Ventures. And I have been running startup bootcamp programs and online, uh, well, nowadays it's online, 10-week uh, incubation programs, teaching other people how to create their own nonprofit businesses in other areas. And so far, we've had two cohorts of a dozen uh, founders. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've had a diversity of companies from, uh, you know, somebody starting a post-growth law firm, you know, to another person with a post-growth um, brewery <laughs> and another person who had a post growth design company, <laughs> you know, and uh, we had one classical musician also who was in there who's doing some uh, some great initiatives that we're trying to uh, see the the degree to which we can marry uh, business with uh, with culture, you know. And uh, we also had some people in the developing world. We had this one uh, woman called uh, Monica who is running basically a combination between a for profit uh, event uh, company called uh, Sister Speaks from Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and she's also running this great NGO uh, called uh, Heels for Pads that is basically combating menstrual poverty in uh, rural Kenya. And she's using also proceeds from the uh, commercial company to, to help fund the activism in Heels for Pads. You know, <laughs> we can all do this, but we have to want to and we have to understand that this is an option. You know, so what we really need is incubators that can teach this, you know, and we also need role models, you know, we need case studies, you know, and, and one company doing this is an anomaly. A, a dozen companies doing this is okay, it's, you know, starting to look like something, you know, 100 companies doing this a thousand companies doing this, you know, at a certain point, you know, the more of us individual entrepreneurs start to, to go out on a limb and, and play with these not-for-profit business structures, the more of this will get normalized. <laughs> and the more that this also will get uh, brought into our business curriculums and also will be taught in, in incubators <laughs> alongside, uh, you know, more classical social entrepreneurship and also normal classical Silicon Valley style entrepreneurship as being an option. And I'm not saying that everyone's gonna do this. <laughs> you know, a lot of people won't, but that's okay. <laughs> because if even a small number of us do does, <laughs> you know, we're gonna basically start building a parallel economy. And what's really quite interesting is if you build a company that is essentially of itself, and it can't be sold, <laughs> you know, uh, then basically not bleeding money to investors is a competitive advantage on the market <laughs> because the money that you are not dividending out to the 1% is money that you are spending on your employees. It is money that you are sp spending on research and development and making better products and services, you know, in, uh, in, in, in making the prices uh, more reasonable for your customers, paying your staff better. I mean, <laughs> there is nothing good about bleeding money. <laughs> You know, but they make it sound like commercial companies are the only ones somehow that, that are serious. But again, losing money in this way is a, is a competitive disadvantage. The other thing also is that ethics has mark, market value. Who knew, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, you know, also with radically open security, since I put radically open security on the market, we have shaken up the local computer security market. You know, we are now a medium-sized player on the market with roughly 40 staff members. So, you know, and, and we're regularly winning all kinds of RFPs from large companies, from uh, governments. Uh, let, let, just to give you a sample of the, the customers that we've had, uh, we have been high. One of our customers is Google. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> and by the way, no, we won't do everything for Google. <laughs> we mostly help them with some open source stuff. But other customers include Mozilla, uh, Wikimedia Foundation. Also in the Netherlands, the Dutch Ministry of Health hired us to security test the our, our Dutch uh, contact tracing app called the Corona Melder. <laughs> uh, also the European Commission hired us to pen test some other nation states apps, including Immuni in Italy, Protogo in Poland, the Google Apple Exposure Notification API, and the new European digital vaccination passports. <laughs> so we are getting some extremely, you know, current and, and very high profile jobs. <laughs> you know, also locally, you know, in the Netherlands, uh, the world's largest supermarket chain, Ahold, uh, you know, we're basically one of their largest suppliers, but also uh, the energy networks, I mean, uh, Tenet and Eco stayed in, but also insurance companies like Aholm and, uh, you know, the list goes on. <laughs> but we also do not-for-profit work at a cost price basis for nonprofits, NGOs, and civil society. Just quite simply because that little free speech organization of Iranian refugees has the scariest attacker model. Like they literally have governments after them and they have almost no budget, <laughs> you know? So we can basically use the big companies to get the flywheel spinning. And then once the flywheel is spinning, we can use that to serve the, uh, you know, the, these not-for-profit uh, players. It doesn't hurt us at all, <laughs> you know, basically to do this because we're doing it at cost for us cost price basis, it's not costing us anything to do this, but it does allow us to be able to offer these, uh, these services at rates that they can actually afford. And the funny thing is, I mean, some of our colleague security companies literally send these nonprofits to us, <laughs> you know, when they approach some of these other security companies, and they're like, sorry, we can't help you, but go talk to radically open security. <laughs> Yeah, I'm proud of this, you know, and we're also part of initiatives like uh, CVCDR, which is a uh, incident response team for uh, civil society, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, we, the commercial jobs sort of like keep the, the fire burning, but, uh, but it's sort of like the, the not-for-profit jobs and the open source jobs that really get us out of bed in the morning. And, you know, the quality of our stuff is due to our business model, <laughs> because, Ethical hackers are very much like open source <laughs> fanatics and, and, you know, it's kind of de DevOps <laughs> style techies. I mean, we're all idealistic. And, you know, the kinds of hackers that don't want to work for the big corporates do want to work for us. And this is the reason why our quality that we can deliver is so high. And that's how we've gotten all of these big customers like the Googles <laughs> and the Mozilla's and the, and the European commissions. <laughs> it's because quite simply, we are competing with other companies in our market for talent, not for customers. Once you have the talent, they're trivial to sell, but we're actually, you know, we're, we're competing for the staff. And that's why actually having a social business model <laughs> makes it much easier for us to hire than it is for our more commercial um, colleagues <laughs> in the market. Three years after Radically Open Security entered the market, the market leader in the Netherlands in cybersecurity introduced an, an ethics policy. Yeah, and, and, pre and previously this company was uh, protested for doing things like building surveillance systems and selling them to ve developing countries. So obviously the introduction of an ethics policy was, uh, you know, there was never any talk of that until we came on the scene. So this is sort of the example of how putting a non-commercial entity on the commercial market can work. You know, it forces them to compete with us for both talent and for customers. And it really causes them to do some very deep soul searching. I hate to stop you there, but we've got a lot of questions coming through from YouTube and it's also fascinating what you're doing. And we've got a lot of responses and a lot of questions. So um, I think it's probably worth now as going through a few of these. I just wondered as well. So we've spoken a lot and I know you used the example from Nigeria there, but do you think this is very much sort of a uh, Western perspective, you know, in particular sort of Eurocentric and sort of American view on what entrepreneurship is? And is there anything we can be learning from sort of other places and, you know, sort of the, like the examples that you mentioned, is there things we can be learning from countries that do things a bit differently? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
I deliberately had some people in the, from the developing world in my incubator. Uh, you know, we had the lady from Kenya. We also had another guy from uh, New Delhi, <laughs> uh, also who was uh, doing a startup in, in childcare. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from the less industrialized countries, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, they still are much more, you know, because their monetized economy is not quite as well developed. It means that they still have more elaborate human networks of human relationships, <laughs> you know, and they also, you know, in some cases have, have a better developed commons, <laughs> you know, if it hasn't been, um, in, you know, destroyed yet. Here's the thing with innovation. Innovation, as we're taught it, is basically taking uh, human relationships and the commons and then turning it in instead into something that's monetized. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, thus building the uh, commercial economy. That's what's kind of interesting also about the degrowth movement. You know, they ask questions like, can you use business as a vehicle for degrowth, which basically means, can you take the monetized economy and instead use your business to return things to the commons and to rebuild human relationships? <laughs> You know, nobody thinks of business in this way, but we should. But, you know, in, in these developing countries, you know, I think that they have very much still have a far better sense of this, you know, and their communities, uh, you know, are they're, they're not quite as individualistic as we are, I think, in, in the West. And I, I think there's still a tremendous amount that we can learn. The other thing also is that uh, within uh, developing countries, they should not be trying to copy us. I think here in the West, <laughs> because what oftentimes happens is they will introduce the same kinds of Silicon Valley style incubators. I heard actually from my friend Monica in Nairobi that actually these the, the, the Kenyan startups won't even get funded if they don't have at least one white co-founder. Wow. It's horrible. That's horrible. So, uh, you know, but, but then we need to think about this. We're bringing in these foreign investors. And if these companies are successful, what's happening is these, the profits from these companies are being extracted out of the company again. You know, mm -hmm. when, I visit, when I visited Nairobi one time, I was, you know, I, I was teaching a class and basically the organization that invited me put me up in this five-star Marriott. It was pretty ridiculous, to be quite honest. But, uh, you know, stop and ask, what does that actually do for the, for the local Kenyan economy? <laughs> because, you know, all of, you, you can call it development and, and sure it was a very big, beautiful uh, hotel, but at the same time, okay, like they were employing a, a, a bit of staff <laughs> there, you know, like maybe in the kitchen or at the reception, they were, in, you know, of course they weren't employing the most desperate. Everybody I think who was employed there probably had a college diploma. <laughs> so, I mean, they were already in a reasonably privileged uh, position, I think, uh, to start out with, uh, to work there in the first place. But then, you know, in the middle of these, you know, with these other neighborhoods, much poorer neighborhoods, not far away. I mean, we had to go through a metal detector. I mean, literally they were scanning for bombs underneath our vehicles <laughs> when we drove into the hotel. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious why this is going to be a target uh, of the locals. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the value is being extracted out of the country. So I think this is why concepts like post-growth business really uh, could apply very much into the developing world. We don't need us Westerners with our savior complexes to basically come in and be telling you know, them how exactly to run their businesses, they can do it themselves, <laughs> you know? And we shouldn't be encouraging them to get in bed with foreign investors either. <laughs> you know, if they're a bit creative and, and they are very creative, you know, they can come up with ways of bootstrapping it <laughs> uh, using their own resources. And then they can ensure that the value produced businesses is in the local communities and they can make sure that the governance these companies also businesses that are created by locals and that remain with locals that, that's what i think it's just my opinion what i think the developing world uh, can really benefit from yeah thank you another youtube question is um from etha alali sorry if i've pronounce your name wrong um who says one of the benefits of setting up this sort of post-growth structure is that you don't have to put yourself through systematically biased processes um vc investments for effort in minorities are less likely and lower valued so it gets closer to the money that you would be getting from a good bootstrap anyway and needs no pitch um 
the optimal size for an organization is well known in countries like Germany. When things get bigger, you get exponentially bigger overheads, etc. Do you think the, in the future, new companies based on things such as climate change focus could change this concept of growth sell and let the f- pension funds pick up the bill instead? I think okay, there may have been two, question, question. <laughs> two questions. Two questions in one. That. Yeah, there's two <laughs> questions in one there. So I think yeah. if you miss off that last sentence, I think um, it's yeah. just a really good comment from YouTube saying, um, "Just go to that question, just a minute. Um, go go into that kind of the uh, the industry is uh, where is it." The, the ethical minority question, I think, is, like, is less likely for lower values. Um, so it gets closer to money that you would be getting from good bootstraps anyway. How, how does your, your work that you're doing, because it, you, know, you are now working with ethical minorities in quite a bit of the, the work mm-hmm. that you do, how is that kind of helping society and making sure that the post-growth um, structure that you're doing is kind of getting, getting more embedded into society? Yeah. Um, There is indeed a well-known bias in venture capital. (laughs) And you've got, of course, uh, impact investors nowadays that are directly tackling this issue head on. Of course, like Arlen Hamilton with Backstage Capital, (laughs) she's very inspiring. (laughs) You know, and what she's doing, uh, particularly for minority and also LGBTQ uh, founders, very admirable. Um, At the same time, Let's stop, let's pause, and let's look at the, look, let's look at the fee structure. <laughs> uh, without a doubt, she has good intentions. That's not even up for question. Um, but I think we do ask to the, the fact, is she ultimately doing the most good that can <laughs> by running her funds you know, with basically with this two and 20 uh, fee structure? Is there a way that you could use a less extractive fee structure, <laughs> um, similar to something like a snowball uh, impact management, where she can basically have a, a cost of service, you know, I mean, she obviously needs to get paid for running a fund, but just something where she's not promising these really big returns uh, for the LPs. So, you know, I think that uh, if we want to really do something for minorities, I think we need to support them, but I think we also need to not embed them within extractive structures because we can accidentally and inadvertently wind up exploiting those same minorities that we were attempting to help, (laughs) you know? And uh, this is sort of, I think, a a little bit what's uh, what's kind of tragic about this. (laughs) It's really easy to be like, yay, let's start a VC fund for women. But at the end of the day, it's still, you know, these fund managers are living off of the fee stream, you know, from these funds. And it's very easy and it's very socially acceptable for them to say, yay, women, and oh, good. Look at how much I'm earning now because of this, you know, 2% asset under management. And people don't understand how extractive 2% actually is. 2% sounds small, right? I mean, two, two, how big could that be? But let's say uh, I'm originally from the US, so, let's say I wanted to save for retirement. So I put my money into a a 401k or an IRA and uh, I keep it there for 30 years, which is basically the typical lifetime of uh, such a retirement fund. Now, if I take the historical performance of the stock market over that 30 years, 2% fees for my fund manager mean that two thirds of my returns over those 30 years, go to the fund manager. Two thirds. People don't realize this. John Bogle from Vanguard uh, talked about this actually quite a bit. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it's the same thing with a mortgage. If you think actually about the amount of uh, interest that you're paying (laughs) on a 2% mortgage, over a lifetime of 30 years, that's also a tremendously huge amount of money. What people don't understand is it's compounding. <laughs> and it's the same way that you have the compounding effect, you know, on interest in a bank account, assuming you don't have negative interest, but all right, <laughs> you know, but the point is, you know, that, that same compounding also applies uh, to these fees. And that's why it adds up so large uh, over this period of time. 
this is also a problem for the pension funds because uh, at the very end of the question was embedded the question, why don't we just let the pension funds pay for all this? I can tell you the pension funds are in crisis right now. <laughs> and the reason why, quite simply, is low interest rates. <laughs> You know, they are finding that they are not able, you know, to, to uh, make almost any money at all on, uh, on, the, on the sort of the safer investments. They're moving into these riskier investments like VC funds because they're desperate, <laughs> you know, and they're looking for basically higher risk, higher return um, rewards because people like you and me, we want to retire and we expect when we retire that those returns are going to be there. <laughs> But the problem is, they're not going to be, you know, if, if uh, the interest rates uh, stay the way that they are. So as of right now, and of course, the worst nightmare for a pension fund is to have to basically renegotiate with the people and say, oh, okay, sorry, so we promised you this pension, actually, we have to give you less because uh, the economy wasn't all that great. Sorry. <laughs> So the pension funds right now are in a very fearful position and they're not going to, they're very conservative also in a lot of their decisions right now, because quite frankly, you know, and remember pension funds are nonprofits themselves. I mean, I can't speak for, for the UK. I'm not sure about the UK, but in the Netherlands, pension funds are nonprofit. <laughs> you know, they're really actually just there for the public good. Um, I understand in other countries that's, that could be different. Um, but, but even within that, remember that these pension funds are still having their assets management, their assets managed, and those fund managers that are doing the asset management for the pension funds are charging 2% fees. <laughs> you start seeing how this, how this is going. I mean, the entire system is bleeding money. <laughs> You know, we need to start questioning this. And I think a whole lot of this also starts with education. There's a really great student group uh, that's called Rethinking Economics. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it started with um, Occupy Wall Street. Remember them? <laughs> you know, they did a walkout on EC10, the Introduction to Economics class at Harvard University of Professor Gregory Mankiw. So, the, 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 so they, they, they sat, sat in the front row and then they stood up and then they said, we do not want the ideology that you are teaching in this class. And then they walked out. You know? And then the students after this, you know, they organized themselves into this, you know, these re rethinking economics, also the post-crash economic society, and they evaluated why is it that our economics programs are only teaching, you know, rational economic men and, uh, you know, neoclassical uh, <laughs> economics when it's not working, <laughs> you know, and we need to update our economics curriculum to include Marxist economics and environmental, you know, ecological economics and feminist economics and, you know, all of these other great, you know, branches that can help us to actually address the problems of this century, <laughs> you know, but what, st what students need to understand is we also need walkouts from our entrepreneurship programs because it's not any better. <laughs> we need walkouts from our MBA programs. We need walkouts from our incubator programs. We also need walkouts from our finance programs as well, <laughs> because those also who are participating in finance education, they are learning about shareholder primacy <laughs> and how to maximize profits for shareholders. And they are learning about things like international taxes, AKA how to avoid paying them. <laughs> you know, this, you know, there is a huge hidden curriculum, you know, in the business school. There's a very interesting article by yet another great British academic, actually, named Martin Parker, uh, who uh, wrote, so this article is called Bulldoze the Business School. And he actually extended this out also uh, into, into a, a full length book. And he actually goes through examining each of the business school subjects <laughs> and uh, sort of saying, you know, this is the hidden curriculum within uh, the business school, you know, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, CSR and ethics or finance or marketing or, you know, <laughs> automation or whatever, you know, and really eye-opening, 
you know, <laughs> also us students, you know, who, who can do things like have conversations with our professors about the education that we're receiving. You know, we, we, can, we can read this and, and start to, to, to create these dialogues. So, you know, and th this is, I think, the direction where it needs to go. Because if we want, you know, to create business as, as a form of activism, you know, create business as a mixed media for art, create business as a vehicle for spirituality, you know, or business as a, as a means for, for creative personal expression, you know, we are not going to get this with the education system that we have now. So we need to start talking about it. We need a discourse, <laughs> you know, and, and the more of us start talking about it, the more gradually we will get mind share. Don't worry about winning over the skeptics. We don't have to. We do not have to worry about the people who don't think this way. We can basically just form our own communities, be the change you know, that we want to see, create these alternative uh, businesses with, with not-for-profit business structures, whether you're creating a not-for-profit hairdresser or a not-for-profit investment fund, take your pick. But there's this whole world we haven't explored yet. And to me, this is the next generation of social entrepreneurship. Yeah. I think that's a great point looking at the time we could be talking about this for hours but I think that's a great point to end on today and I think you know we need to be thinking about this shift and it really does start in sort of the business schools and with the you know with the students as well so yeah thank you so much for talking with us today it's been really insightful I've learned a lot and um yeah thank you for your questions for those who've been watching at home and thank you again to Melanie. If people want to find out more information, do you have a Twitter? Do you have a website or anything that people can find you on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you are interested in uh, security audits, <laughs> you can always uh, look up my company, Radically Open Security at radicallyopensecurity.com. Uh, if you're interested in my business ideas and in the incubator uh, that I'm running, uh, we will, I think in September, be opening up applications for the uh, 2022 incubator. You can go to postgrowthentrepreneurship.com. And I've also got uh, quite a number of videos uh, there that you can watch. I've got a TED Talk. I've also got uh, like six hours of video that I've recorded at a workshop. And uh, yeah, and anybody who needs anything, wants anything, wants to ask questions, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm the only Melanie Ryback that I'm aware of. And also, uh, or otherwise, uh, just uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Brilliant. Thank you. And yeah, thank you once again. And yeah, thanks to those at home. And thank you, Caroline, for your lovely questions as well. Thank so, yeah. you. It was very enjoyable. Thank you so much. I've learned so much as well. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you oh. for inviting me. Anytime. Sorry, it couldn't be in person, but... <laughs>